<coughs> thanks, Rob. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, you know, kick off the afternoon session with half an hour review of what's been going on in the wonderful world of sharks, uh, listening to Jaws serialised, or, or one afternoon of Jaws on Radio 4 just the other weekend. You've got all these wonderful quotes from it, you know. That sharks create a gut reaction in people and all that kind of thing. Terribly exciting. So I'm going to give you the, the, the rest of it. So um, sharks uprooted. Okay, so there are about 1,100 species, nearly 1,200 species of living chondrichthians. And they now get the uh, distinctiveness of being um, officially the most evolutionary distinct clade of nathostomes. What does that mean? That means in terms of sort of the total branch length of the clade when you more or less divvy that up between each terminal taxon, each living chondrichthian represents about 26 million years of independent evolution. That means they're twice as important as any lysamphibian, <laughs> three times as all squamates, they come into that bracket too, three times as significant. You know, wipe out a shark, you could get away with wiping out three mammals, or in fact four birds. Now, I haven't bothered to work out what this means in terms of the number of teleosts you could stamp on in order to save a shark, you know, equivalents. However, they, they are, um, in this sense, an important reservoir of biodiversity. Uh, their early history, that's what I'm going to be talking about, what's going on in the Paleozoic. And this has changed radically over the past 10, 15 years as we've mucked around the base of the Nathostome tree. And in this convenient frame presented by Matt Friedman, Martin Brazeau, it, it really sums it up very quickly. Sharks are not primitive in terms of, you know, they, textbooks still have them as the kind of best living ancestor. When you go into the standard museum display and look at the transition from jawless to jawed forms, you'll see something that looks vaguely torpedo-shaped with a series of gill slits. And the idea that the first arch is transformed mysteriously but rather wonderfully into jaws and a hybrid arch and so forth. Um, and, you know, now we look at these things and think, well, no, being micromeric is derived, losing ossification is derived, probably being fairly small, around 10 centimetres, moving up into the necton, etc. They're doing something specialised. It's the osteichthians which have got this legacy, this plesiomorphic legacy of having a heavily ossified skeleton, having a head covered in plates, etc., etc. So, uh, moving on to, again, copy... Uh, and this sort of much copied tree summary, which still works pretty well from uh, Martin Brazil and Matt Friedman's efforts here. This represents more or less consensus of what's going on at the base of the tree. And we're going down here with the chondrichthians in this sort of orangey colour and the osteichthians in green, pachyderms down here, suggesting the split is somewhere deep in the Silurian. If you start taking this data set to pieces, you realise that the osteichthian surprise, surprise, character rich, and the chondrichthian side is character poor. And that's what myself and my colleagues, who I should have listed diligently at the beginning of this, uh, John Finarelli and uh, Kristen Teachin and Rob Guess and a whole series of others, Ivan Sansom and so forth, we've been working on this data set to try and increase the character set that we can use to analyse what on earth is going on with the early chondrichthians. One of the major shifts in this is, of course, moving onto the base of the tree here, the acanthodians. So we now have this um, opportunity where we can go back to the uh, Sepkowski data set through time again. This is from <coughs> Matt Friedman and Lauren Salan. They took Sepkowski's data set through time, and I've merely recolored it, so we've got a curve running through most of the fossil record, and you can see here the chondrichthians start off thin, get a bit fatter, and then thin out again, and, you know, continue in the minority. It's purely during the Carboniferous that they just about hold their own with the osteichthians and other taxa knocking around there, and a significant part of the vertebrate aquatic community <coughs> at that point. So, if we therefore look at the acanthodian clade, are we able to line these up into a kind of seamless transition from some sort of bags of scales and a few plates down in the Silurian or end of the Silurian through to more conventional shark-like conditions as we move through the Devonian? Will they line up appropriately and give us a nice simple transformational series? <clears throat> well, one taxon to test this, and say so this talk will be sort of three stories. First of all, this thing, Gladbacchus in the mid-Devonian of Germany. Um, 
And it's got a nice gill skeleton, and a brain case up there, and a bunch of scales at the back. Brief summary of what's going on with this thing. It's one of four so-called unambiguous sharks from the lower to middle Devonian. Unsurprisingly, the shark body fossil record is pretty poor for reasons everyone here knows. CT scanned it. I should say this is in Cambridge, the best of my knowledge, being restored after UPS and FedEx did their best to it in transit. <clears throat> this bit is now kind of concave and shattered, but it is rest all the bits are in the box, I promise you. Uh, but it is possible to take a flat specimen and dissect it with the you know, wonders of CT scanning. So here's the palate quadrate. This is the brain case in grey. The lower jaw is snaking all the way through here. And we've got the hyoid arch and gill skeleton tucked in behind. So just briefly, some of the, the key factors in this. First of all, it ought to be showing a set of nice key characteristics of sharks. If it's an unambiguous shark, it should be micromeric, it should have calcified cartilage, perichondral bone absent, and the gills behind the head, etc. And you can see nice and clearly here, the gill skeleton in the standard shark is tucked behind the head. Of course, that's not what you find in osteichthyan. Take a trout apart, the gills are mostly underneath the brain, underneath the, the brain case. And in fact, if you look at a placoderm, the gills are tucked underneath the brain case. So that reorganization of the head, getting a long neck, moving the gills back, is a distinctively shark-like thing. So score one, it's, it's shark-like there. When we look at the scales, you expect to see the classic placoid scale. Again, you know, standard textbook material with a nice neck canal and sort of little sort of multi or single cusped head on, etc. They're not like that at all. These scales, this is work that was done by Ivan Sansom and Clayman Andreev in Birmingham. When you look at the scales, they look, if anything, like placoderm scales. If you found those isolated in this particular unambiguous shark, you'd probably label it Ohio Aspis, which is a scale form generally associated with the back of the placoderm ichthyology handbook and uh, knocks around in the Devonian of the States. Um, the cartilage, well, yes, it's calcified cartilage, but it's not the classic tessellate calcified cartilage here. The only place you find nice little islands of tessery or little lumps of calcified cartilage in the endoskeleton are bizarrely in the inner ear. These are the surrounds for the semicircular canals. That's actually one of the ampullae. Elsewhere, you have a mesh of calcified cartilage in the skeleton, um, as if continuous strands of calcification following the you know, threads of collagen, if you like, through the perichondral mem membrane. Uh, so, as I said, the, the gill skeleton is behind the head, but if you look on the dorsally, it's folded like an osteichthyan, so it's just one more plesiomorphy for osteichthyans, because it has to be a general character. If you look underneath, a surprise, perhaps most underneath, with recent work coming out from Martin Brazone colleagues, was at the back here, it's got this bizarre, very broad uh, keratobranchial connecting. So this is the ventral surface of the gill skeleton. And it's the spit of one of the keratob... Well, it's the posterior most keratobranchial in one of the very few gill skeletons we know any substantial detail from a placoderm. So... It's a bag of plesiomorphies, this fish, as you, you know, surprise, surprise, as we often find. So the question is, where is it going to fit in the tree? Is it going to be somewhere near the, the crown chondrichthys up here or the earliest conventional chondrichthyans? Or is it going to turn out to be an acanthodian, even though it doesn't look like our conventional idea of an acanthodian? Well, the result is it pops right down there in that big mess of things called acanthodians. It branches here in a fairly unresolved, well, slightly resolved here, but we've got a fundamental split in our data set. Now, there's more work to be done on acanthodians, and you can imagine from most of you familiar with the average acanthodian fossil, there's not a lot to go on, but that progress is being made. Um, and this branching pattern is almost certainly going to change. But there seems to be a deep split that we found, and it's not only us that found it with our data set, other people have found similar splits. And the question is whether there's a rump group coming out of the, the acanthodians. So there are rump acanthodii here, but the so-called clematiids, are they the ones that cluster with the conventional sharks? Well, an, an alternative way of looking at this is um, because they won't line up in a nice transformation series, is to 
look at all the synapomorphies of chondrichthians, all the, well, apomorphies by the time you get to the base of the crown. These are all characters that make up conventional sharks. There's nothing very controversial about them, but you can go through the echinthodians, you can score them off here, sort of, you know, how sharky are they? And this is what you get running through that. And this is the score along the backbone of the tree as we get progressively more conventionally sharkoid. Being interested in whether any patterns of homoplasy in this, we came up with a, with a hot plate diagram. And this hot plate diagram is if you score 30 in the centre here, uh, sorry, not 30, if you go 21 out of 21, this is where you've got the, um, you know, if you like, conventional sharks. But we have in these clades, if you like, independent approaches towards this ultimate shark score. So the argument is that we've got a number of groups within the Acanthodians experimenting, if you like, with shark-like conditions. Whatever circumstances one group sustained made it through. But what are they doing down there? What are these homoplasies that come through? And is there any signal in this? And our argument is that there are a number of groups which are independently, say, extending the neck, getting gill slits, getting a large gill skeleton behind. So, contra the conventional idea of, you know, white shark, red death, or something like that, you know, something dangerous in the water, large and predatory. It looks like we've got a number of groups which are heading into the necton and filter feeding. And in fact, this having this extended gill skeleton, this extended neck, might be an important part of the story as we move towards more crownward, more familiar chondrichthian conditions. Um, so here we are, chondrichthians doing their bit for the necton revolution. Because in this respect, they seem to be, if you like, off the bottom rather more rapidly, I would argue, than the osteichthians. What I mean by that is I'm not saying that osteichthians are not going up into the water column, but I'd argue that things like placoderms, etc., are more likely to have more of a demersal set of life habits. Occasional excursions into the water column, but not sustained habits up there. Whereas lightweight, remember they've chucked their bone, small size, they're just up there filter feeding, pursuing plankton, etc. This is probably the root of what the uh, <coughs> early chondrichthians are up to. So, how am I doing time wise? Speed it up, Coates. Right, the uh, big picture. Okay, so here we've got it there. If we start looking at this, how deep do they go? This came up this morning, sort of shouted a question at me in the Bayesian thing. So, how deep? Well, we've got things down here that might or might not be sharks in the Ordovician, the, the Mongolipids, the more challenging stuff. But I would say that something like Tunicanthus from the base of the Silurian. Now, this is a set of isolated scales. I really should have put a picture up of Tunicanthus, although it wouldn't look hugely impressive to you. But the importance of Tunicanthus to me is that it looks like a conventional, absolutely conventional, boring, climateid scale, an Acanthodian scale. Now, bear in mind that Gladbacchus hasn't even acquired conventional placoderm, uh, sorry, conventional <laughs> Acanthodian scales suggest the repertoire of scale morphs in this clade is bigger. So I would argue that something like Tunicanthus is a reasonably confident mark, a, a marker we can place with reasonable confidence for an early split. That means that at this point, if th is this a credible date for the osteichthian chondrichthian split right at the base of the Silurian? Not entirely unreasonable, but it does mean that we're running out of the fossil record of all the other jawed vertebrates. Because by the time you get down to the base of the Silurian, we don't have a great record of, if you like, more crownwood stem stones to line up next to them. It's implying a lot of range extensions. And that, in turn, begs questions of where are these lower Silurian placoderms and all the other things. Well, perhaps part of the answer to that might be Perhaps we shouldn't be thinking about so many ranges going down that far that perhaps these groups are rather more clumped. But this is not part of my research program at the moment. I'm well aware that there are people looking hard at placoderms and wondering, have we got the tree right down there? As opposed to, at the moment, having a, a Hanigian comb with a series of twigs coming off it, nicely progressing towards nathostones. The picture may be clumpier and more complicated. So, a couple of pulses. The second pulse, the early crown radiation, that's what I'm going to look at next. So quick spin through what's going on with the holocephalans. So the holocephalans now reduced, reduced, exciting. Their numbers are climbing spectacularly. So at the moment, we're up to 
I think about 49 described species. A couple of years ago, it was 47. Actually, it's going up alarmingly quickly. What do I mean by it? So if we were going to look at a curve of holocephalins collected through time, we're just hitting a hockey stick moment where they're shooting, which means, can we estimate how many holocephalins there are down there? Well, I suppose in theory, no, because it's over the top. I'm not proposing that there are thousands of species down there. This is more of a side effect of deep sea trawling. We're getting to the bottom of the cupboard, folks, and as a bycatch of that, we keep pulling up new taxa of holocephalins in particular. So mostly down to, well, they're, they're bottoming out about 2,600 metres. Physiological reasons, they're unlikely to go deeper than that, whereas osteichthyans can. So the problem with them forever has been that the fossil forms are pretty much like the extant forms. At least to my way of thinking, that's pretty much like that. So Carboniferous, Chondrichthyes, that's uh, Hydrolagus. So um, no, it's not. It's Calorhynchus. Get it right. So we've got a whole series of specializations. You've got this highly consolidated brain case. All the fissures are closed. Palate fused the brain case. Huge orbit. Skull roof closed. There's no classic pre-cerebral fontanelle for all of you who've done dogfish dissections. They just don't have it. Uh, the endolymphatic ducts coming off the ears, absolutely central, central pipeline going up to the top of the head. And they have this weird ethmoid canal, a whole extra tube through the nose for carrying branches of nerves five and seven down to this huge sensory array in the rostrum and highly specialised and rather wonderful nostrils. Uh, as I said, the problem is that when we look down the stem, they all look highly specialised by the time we find them. So it's always been a bit of a mystery, how do they fit into the clade, and drawers and drawers full of isolated tooth plates. They're hideously specialised dentition. Right, so this is where a project with Rob Guest, my colleague in South Africa, comes in. I've always been intrigued by a nodule that's described in the mid-80s by Ulufsen with a sharp brain case inside it. So this is Permian, early Permian, and when we looked inside it, we found a beautifully preserved brain case from a Samoriad shark. And Samoriad sharks are well known through the Carboniferous, Devonian Carboniferous, and a few stragglers in the Permian. And they all look pretty much like this. You've got a huge orbit, nostrils at the front, brain, you know, uh, the otic capsules, etc., at the back. But usually they're thoroughly flattened and pancaked. This CT scanned beautifully, and the cartilage is absolutely paper thin. And there we have a series of Samoriads. And basically, you could take this kind of brain case and drop it in any of these. This is from Alan Pradell's work on material from Kansas, Ozarkus. And you see it's more or less the same as one of those, only his is flattened and ours isn't. But you've got the idea, OK? So terribly conservative. They're even conservative to the extent of, and please don't tweet this or snap it, this is a set, a beautifully preserved set of Devonian cladodont jaws, the most perfect set I've ever seen, all the natural curvature. You can take them and stick them on a Permian skull. It's that, it's, you know, can you imagine doing something like that to a fossil mammal? You know, take an 80 million year old set of mammal jaws and stick them on a modern mammal brain case. Um, so it's part spin construction. Bit of those, stick them on those. The proportions change ever so slightly, but extremely conservative. The trick is what's going on inside these things. Work, damn you. And this was the, uh, you know, here's the predictable CT movie where we crack open the Easter egg. And inside, when it eventually decides to uh, stop spinning around, um, inside we've got a, a nice endocast showing the, the ears in beautiful condition and a very strangely shaped cranial space containing the brain. But what it's got here in the ears and the front here, characteristic chimera. It's a chimera on the inside. Even though the outside's conservative, by the time we get to the front, and here we have Calorhynchus, here we have this Permian tax on Dwykosolacus. We've got this drop nose here. You get to the front of the midbrain and you drop before you head off towards the forebrain. Short olfactory tracts down to the nostrils here. Here are the superficial ophthalmic nerves, which instead of going over the orbit and around the outside, head down the midline. It's got a closed pre it has no pre-cerebral fontanelle, and the uh, ears are a dead giveaway. They've got this very characteristic central, if you like, conning tower tube up to the roof of the skull. So it's a good, strong signature. 
So now we can take all the Samoriads and dump them with the holocephalans. So Cladocelarchy, the little shark that tried, the one that's always in the textbook is the most ancient shark. It's a, it's a stem group ratfish. It's a holocephalan. It's a ghost shark. Why do we call it an elephant shark? Any of these terms, it's one of those things. Uh, the very large orbits in these things, they simply graph this out, orbit length versus uh, basic cranial length, etc. They all cluster over with it's a very strong trend. They're getting these huge orbits. And we just wonder whether that's something to do with the clade moving off the continental shelf into deeper water. Because there was this, uh, I don't, you know, those of you who saw this paper in 2013, uh, Guino, etc., it was the, the, the best ever Lazarus taxon that a cladodont tooth turning up in the Cretaceous, something like a 120 million year gap, and their argument was these things have just gone in deep water and then they pop up late. It would be consistent with the general, if you like, uh, habits of the Chimera clade. So if we move those in, we discover that everything's a bit of a Chimera down there. It really is quite impressive how, if we look at just family level, this is just raw family totals, no range extensions. Everything in the yellow box there is, is some kind of stem group holocephalon or Chimera. So we've got the Acanthodians, things that are probably elasobranchs, more on them in a sec. But you see, as you move across the end of onion extinction, suddenly burst forth lots and lots of Chimeras. So if you go through a, a, you know, uncontroversial classification of at least major family groups, everything marked with a dot there now turns out to be some kind of chimera. Or if you go to a, a locality such as Bear Gulch in the States, everything marked with a dot there is a chimera of some sort. In fact, the only things that something like Bear Gulch that aren't are osteichthians. So this inshore marine environment absolutely dominated by this major branch, this fundamental division of the crown group, begs the question of what are the Elasmobranchs doing? So their record has been somewhat more cryptic, but we do have things like Tinacanths down here and whatever Tinacanths are, and the Xenacanths. So it's from this side of the tree where you really get the first, you know, where are the big ones with big teeth? The early apex predators, and things like Goodrichthys and some other very large forms, which sound wood, for example, is pulling out of um, uh, Mumby Quarry, this lateral equivalent of Glen Carter, which is a Visayan locality in Scotland. They're coming off here somewhere, but this part of the tree is, is pretty wobbly. What I want to focus on is material from Wardy, so yet more stand wood material, and a lot of other people too have been collecting. So collecting from Wardy, it's Granton Harbour in Edinburgh, one of the more salubrious parts of Edinburgh. I do recommend it if you're into collecting bottle tops and various other discards down there. Vintage cigarette packets and stuff. Uh, so it goes back to Lord Greenock, and um, in fact, no doubt he was having minions out there collecting the stuff in the mud for him. Described by Agassiz, Traquair, uh, Stan Woods collecting from it in the 70s, and also just a fantastic example of where you can find things from roadworks just up the road from Granton Harbour where they were I don't know, doing the gas main or something. You get more of those beds coming up. And this material yields quality fish, but it's been intractable. It's been really difficult to get into the nodule. So there's the Matopticius, the kind of thing that gets me excited, nerdy raffin fish. This just last year in nature, uh, the Fiscus, tetrapod, uh, uh, showing CT scans there. And this stuff's in press at the moment from Matt Friedman and myself and Sam Giles. So CT scanning works with this material. But what I'm going to go on about is, let's take a nodule and see how far you can push it. So first of all, there is a characteristic oil shale shark biota from there, which is described by John Dick. Uh, and here they all are. All of these are elasmobranchs. And this is a brackish, more, less marine-influenced biota. So I'm wondering here whether we've got a fundamental division about how the groups are beginning to occupy slightly different environments, some kind of partitioning going on at this point. Now I'm going to look particularly at Tristycheus, and we have a whole suite of nodules, ironstone nodules from there, which we've been able to CT scan, and we've got the entire airfix kit of the internal anatomy out of it, and we have it in duplicate. We have several specimens many specimens with their gill skeletons and their brain case and all the parts. This is uh, a peach specimen 
and paleobotany. So some example, here's the palate quadrate, upper jaw, here's the lower jaw mandible, the hyoid arches, etc., brain cases, and the labial cartilages. We have enough to be able to put it back together. This work is about to be submitted. So here is the brain case and the jaws and the hyoid arch, and in fact we've got the entire gill skeleton, etc., and tristichius revised. Now, with that kind of material, we can start putting comparisons with other things. So here's a Sumorian. Two minutes, yeah. Uh, you can see it's built very differently. Very limited space for jaw muscles, etc. Altogether, much more stout apparatus than a hyoid arch. What it's built like is a suction feeder, an enhanced suction feeder. Now, we know everything is in sort of incipient suction feeding in the water, vertebrates. It's what vertebrates do. But having the kind of enhanced suction feeding you see today in things like uh, nurse sharks and many, many raven fishes, teleosts. So the key thing here is we've got enough material to build a, both a physical model and a computer model. We can treat it as a series of four-bar linkages, uh, and in fact, interesting linkages that violate uh, standard biomechanical versions of what four-bar linkages are. And we can also build a digital model which allows us to quantify these movements in a way that has previously been done with modern bass, etc. So this is working with Aaron Olson, who works with Beth Brainerd's group doing XROM, etc. analyses of how modern fishes work. And we're able to push this this much further with this. So we're able to um, explore, if you like, motion space to a much greater degree than you can with a physical model in terms of working out what these things can do. From within this, we can then calculate a specific plausible trajectory of motion action sequence through here, and we can measure off, quantify the rotation of the various arches. All well and good. The key thing that we can get in here is note that peak jaw depression occurs before peak hyoid depression. Fine, that's thoroughly conventional. Wouldn't it be nice if we could work out where peak volume increase is going on. Well, we can because we've got a physical model. We can just directly measure volume through that. And we can demonstrate that peak jaw depression occurs before peak volume is achieved. And that is an absolute dead cert marker for enhanced suction feeding because what it implies is that the jaws are closing while the oral volume is still increasing. So what we've got here for, and this can only be one of a larger set that we're in at, you know, incompletely sampling of what's going on in the early elasmobranchs post Devonian is expansion into new knee space, enhanced capture of elusive prey. This must have had a major impact on predator prey dynamics and ecosystems at that time. Demonstrates evolvability of the feeding mechanism. And it also demonstrates further proof of principle about the sheer quality of data that we can get from Wardy and similar localities. What it also points out is that. 2D metrics of jaws, which give us a great starting point to understand the paleobiology and function of these early fishes, are insufficient. They are going to be blind to really major changes such as this move into enhanced suction feeding. So that's the end of it. New phylogenies, time scale, stem lineage, small nectonic suspension feeders, Crown clade divisions moving in quite different and distinct directions biomechanically and moving into quite different kind of environments. Thank you.